Uh, hi, welcome to Politics for People Who Hate Politics. Possibly episode 13, lucky 13. Definitely episode, fuck if I know, because it's hard to keep track. Um, I have two lovely guests here now. Uh, my dear sweet brother Joe will wander in eventually, um, and other people probably won't. But if they do, it won't be that surprising, because I invited them. Uh, my proper guests are uh, Michelle Montalvo who hasn't been around in a while, but we like her a lot. Um, she is no longer an intern, and she still likes sci-fi, presumably. Yep. That's, the, <laughs> that's the introduction she gets today. Um, and my other guest, God knows why he wanted to be on here, but he actually did, which is very flattering, um, is Mike Miller, who is the singer-songwriter of and main duty and Endless Mike and the Beagle Club, my favorite band that lives anywhere near me, and maker of many fine albums. Um, and that's exciting. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for having me. No and problem. A, and a fan of sci-fi. You could have added that at the end. Uh, everyone here is. Even better. Yeah. All of us here. Actually, I'm wearing a Star Wars-related hoodie right now. It's got the Death Star on it. What's on that mug? Um, I believe it is hit points related to coffee. That was a boyfriend oh. thing. I, think I, I, think I, I also a have R2D a mug ready. For a second. Got a Doctor nice. Who mug I'm drinking ginger tea out of. Cool. Nice. Yes. We're well prepared here. <laughs> we are so prepared for this. Um, man, I it's I gotta say words and, and do this right when we have so few guests. Um, all right. So we're gonna talk about the po pose. Um, um so and the. <laughs> I don't know why this is funny. I apologize future audience or one viewer who might actually be there right now. Um, all right, so the police. We've been having a whole thing since August, since the shooting of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, where people are actually talking about the police. Everybody. It became a legitimate mainstream media topic for months, which is a good thing, you know, as opposed to it being ignored or covered by... Um, special people like Radley Balco or, to a lesser extent, me. Um, so we all have been caring, and that's awesome. And there's been talk about it, and even conservatives have been like, well, maybe we don't like, you know, maybe since we are supposed to dislike the government, maybe we should uh, talk about cops a little bit. And then we had the backlash, because some uh, douchebag killed two NYPD cops on December 20th. Oh, look, it's Joe! Yay. Better late than never, young man. Yeah, it's me. It he is. Was, he was on his way, he got pulled over. Yeah, by the no, police. No. We're talking about the police, Joe. Hi. Hi, hello. <laughs> this is Mike Miller. I tried to get you to come to see his show with Claire, and, and you were busy having to work at 6 a.m. tomorrow. So yes. you, you Sunday, missed Sunday shows are a problem for the music industry in general. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like Mike's band a lot better than yours, Joe. I'm sorry. That's fine. My band <laughs> like isn't a lot. that good. So. <laughs> You're fine. You play a fine bass, um, but I still like his band a lot better. That's cause... perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> good to know. Hey, I just realized we forgot to put our lower thirds on. The problem with Ooh. this is I forgot how to do this. I forgot to do a how to do a podcast. I think it's too late at this point. <laughs> All right. Sweet Jesus. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about the cops and how there's now officially a backlash against the backlash against the cops. And there's a lot of backpedaling from, from Weasley people who, you know, who find it too hard to question the police when anything bad has happened to a police officer in the past ten minutes. Um, and there's this whole campaign, you know, um, Blue Lives Matter as a counter to, bl to Black Lives Matter, which is so fundamentally annoying and so unnecessary that I can't even begin to describe it. Great. The difference is that I don't. it's not part of American culture that you have to insist that Blue Lives Matter. That's the big difference. Well, it's I implied. Think. I mean, it's implied, isn't it? It's right. implied there by are, most uh, people. It's implied by most people. There is not a big argument that says that the lives of cops don't matter, you know, whether implicit or otherwise. And I think you could say otherwise about Black Lives Matter. There are people who would make, you know, oh, it's got to be all lives matter. It's got to be all whatever. Right. So there's, I mean, 
Sorry. I was just going to say there's there's structural things in America and society that kind of you know black lives are supposed to matter, but you know some of these drug laws maybe they don't matter as much, you know, as opposed to police where we're kind of taught from right. childhood that they're kind of a higher you know, they're not as high as the, the troops, probably, but they're at almost a higher level of, you know, citizen. There's almost a whole, to the point where they're not there's, citizens. Anymore. There's, like, a math situation that someone has got to be able to make this into a legitimately, like, an equation where we talk about you know, how much more important an American soldier is compared to anyone foreign, how much more important a soldier is to, to us, and how much more important a cop is than, than the rest of us. And especially more than some, you know, black kid who had the indecency to wear a hoodie, which yeah. I'm wearing right now, you know. In protest? No, it has the Death Star on it. <laughs> I just like it. In protest of the innocent lives lost on the Death Star. <laughs> Actually, I think the Death Star, the Death Star hoodie is more in support of Blue Lives Matter, mm. right? Right? I don't know, yeah. <laughs> the I Empire. Think... <laughs> There's the that Empire whole... Lives Matter. <laughs> I mean, there is that clerks conversation, right, where they talk about. I mean, it's a fair, it's a fair conversation to have. I've had that equivalent five thousand trillion times about. They're probably oh, the, they're, the contractors yeah. on the Death Star, yeah. Not, okay, not the contractors, but there must. Like, I mean, are there janitors, droids, or sentient sure. there droids? Like, there's some problems there. I'll say this though: the band in, in, on uh, Job of the Hutt's ship, mm -hmm. when they blow off the ship, and the, in the even the band dies. Right. That's that's yeah. definitely. Ethical problem. You know, you know why I, you know why I think it's it's okay is because when when they're uh, you know when Luke's threatening them, they laugh at him too. Is that all it takes, Mike? Really? Those, yeah, those guys are assholes too. They should go. Too. <laughs> wow, that's hard. Yeah. You know what you're getting into if you're playing a party at Java's house. <laughs> that's true. That yeah. Is, uh... yeah. Would you do it, Joe? I'd do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unless it was a Sunday. Unless it was a Sunday night. <laughs> I'll do a Saturday night at Java's. <laughs> if the pay's right, definitely. There the credits, go. pays enough credits. <laughs> well, See, I mean, the guy that played the keyboard, he's all blue. Blue lives matter. <laughs> according to Star Wars cards, um, like I remember, Joe, like some of the people at Java's Palace were good, and some of them were not good, right? Isn't there a mixture with Star Wars cards? <sighs> yeah, the band was, I think, was. It's like a mix. The light side, like, but. You know, they, they knew what they were getting into. <laughs> I agree. It helps me sleep a little better at night. <laughs> that everybody that's there is like, they want to see people get eaten by that big thing. They want to, they want us, you know what I mean? That's why they're there, even the uh, band. So they deserve it. Man, this is getting, uh, <laughs> this is getting tough. I don't know. <sighs> well... <laughs> This is very depressing. This is getting militant. It That's is. the word I was I looking guess, for. I guess, I guess the parallel, I mean, I'm sure they don't deserve it. They don't deserve it, you know. Nobody deserves it. But we're talking about with the backlash of a backlash, you know. I your... wish so badly this could be my ethics training. Like, I can just submit this. Be like, yeah, I'm done. Come just use Star Wars terminology, and they can't get you on anything. It's, I was just talking about Star Wars. I wasn't being subversive at all. Just Star Wars. Right, right. Simple Star Wars talk. It's, and it's all ethics. It's just <laughs> back to ethics. ethics. All right. To, to bring it back to a more depressing and less childhood whimsical topic, um, so randomly, you know, jumping cops and, and, and assassinating them is, is, is probably not a good thing. I think it's kind of creepy that we can't honestly discuss, you know, what self-defense might mean when people put on certain uniforms and are granted certain powers because, you know, then we have to go, oh, hey, NSA, oh, FBI list, my file's growing right now. But basically, the cops who got killed, like, we don't know a thing about them and neither did the guy who killed them. Um, and that could have been the least, you know, awful people in the entire NYPD. We have no idea. And he didn't know, so... But when you're pushed, uh, you know, I don't know. You can't, you're right. It's hard to, like, you don't want to sound like you're making excuses. And I'm not trying to be childish and whimsical here when I say this, but, like, it's easy. It's, it's, you see how easy it is to say, like, well, that band, they hung out with Job of the Hut. They deserved it. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like, no, it's yeah. some, I'm not saying anybody deserves it. Nobody deserves it, right? So that's trying to bring it back around to. But it's so easy to be 
I mean, to, it, to, these cops are, are were dehumanized. You know what I mean? And that, but I mean, obviously that happens on the other side of it too. If they thought about these kids that they're killing, their their parents, their their friends, their whatever. You know, obviously they're dehumanized in those moments too, and their their uh, their supporters completely dehumanize people. You know what I mean? When they talk about my, with Michael Brown and all that, like, well, he shouldn't have stole cigars because clearly, you know, the punishment for stealing cigars is summary execution. Of and course, a, you know, by a cop. Do you know what I mean? Like. It's about the people on both sides dehumanizing people. And yeah, it's just more systematic, a zillion times more systematic on the cop side. They do have the power. They have the legal monopoly on lethal force. Right, um, and isn't that what profiling is? Is to, you know, you don't see the person. You see the profile, you know? Mm-hmm. So, and, I don't know. I yeah. mean, you get all, everybody gets all shocked and appalled when it goes the other way. Do you know what I'm saying? What? It's. I mean, you can call it blowback. Right? It's. A, it's. A, if the if the guy was politic, like consciously being, you know, political actor instead of more like a Jared Lochner, I'm totally unhinged from reality type of thing. If he was doing this very purposefully, like I want to kill a cop because they're bad, even though he shot his ex girlfriend and no one gave a shit about that because <laughs> she doesn't matter, obviously. Weren't they not the only two cops? Wasn't there? Or haven't there been a couple other ones? What was there a guy um, in Florida? Yeah, there was there was a guy in Florida who um, I'm blanking on the circumstances of that, but it also seemed pretty um, you know like the same in, inexcusable. Kind of yeah. But the same kind of blowback, or maybe that was just how it was getting spun. Well, you know, I mean, the, the thing about if you're talking about mattering. blowback in terms of foreign policy, though, you're talking about like 9/11, and no one's going to say, "Oh, 9/11 was awesome, you guys," but it was a response in a large part to the U.S., you know, and the West being in ridiculously intrusive for uh, a century or so. So if people start getting pissed off on cops and they start killing them, is that, I mean, that's blowback too. And the response to that is probably going to be a crackdown on, you know, like a cooling of dissent towards cops and the same type of thing that happened. It's all... Well, weren't people also just arrested recently for... Uh making threats on Twitter. I mean, this is, this is now yeah, a crackdown on speech. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what the, what the tweets said or, you know, the, how vitriolic all of it was, but, I mean, it, it's definitely not uh, looking promising. Well, as far as I know, I was thinking about, you know, people kept referencing the protesters, like minority protesters, obviously, who were chanting, you know, what do we want, dead cops. Mm-hmm. And, like, I'm obviously not a lawyer, but as far as I know, that that's legal speech because it's, you know, incredibly vague and it's not... It, it, there's 800,000 law enforcement officers. Like, the threat implied in that is not nearly specific enough to be illegal as far as I know. It may be um, classless, but it's it's legal and uh, I don't know. There's going to be a chilling who, effect that bothers Who do we blame for the cops? I mean, it gets back to, like, what are the the root causes, you know, is, I mean, killing cops is never acceptable, really, except for, you know, maybe in self-defense if it came to that. But, I mean, who do you blame? Do you blame each individual actor? No, you have to, I mean, it's a systemic thing. The you same blame way. both. It's both. But I feel like that's just too easy. You're dragging everything down to a level of violence when you should be trying to build everything up to, you know, equality. And humanity, right? Humanizing. Right, yeah. Again. You yeah. Humanize both sides. Yeah. You don't want to start dehumanizing one side to equal, you know, some of their treatment yeah. to, you know... I mean, I mean, I, much- it's a slippery slope where you start, you know, where you end blaming, you know... Mm, there's uh, blaming and there's condoning like summary execution and there's a lot there's a lot of stuff in the middle. Um, so I mean, I mean, are we as Americans liable for the actions of you know the government? Well, that's the whole, that's the whole, that's that's the nasty thing about democracy is that like what, is everybody who votes culpable? Like are they just drenched in blood? You could make a very depressing argument that there's some truth to that. Cumulative, just the one, yeah. Just the ones that vote, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's elements of truth to it, but I, I think it's just it's, an, the it's too easy of an argument to make when you're trying to be kind of a jag off. 
and just make it so easy. You know, you have to find the lowest common denominator to blame. You know, there is, you know, a problem in America with too much power for cops, and mostly it's because of the unions, pretty much, and, you know, the power they've accumulated and the power that Americans and lawmakers have granted cops. But that doesn't excuse the individual actors. You can be a pretty right, okay cop, or you can be a completely corrupt... And it's completely right. ignoring the racial component of all this, which, How's like, it? makes it murky, murkier. Well, not addressing the fact that, you know, race is still a problem here, and that there, there's definitely a certain demographic of people that show up to the Blue Lives Matter protests, and there are people, you know, there's definitely, like, a different demographic that shows up to the counter-protests. It, it, it's not just about power. I, I wish it were, because that's... Then we can talk about lowest common denominator and making it, you know, like a fair and balanced kind of uh, discussion. Um, but then the, the treading the, you know, waters of race in America that keeps it from ever getting to that point. But, I mean, even that's kind of like a power struggle because mm -hmm. you, know, you have the laws that have been entrenched over hundreds of years that kind of, is, you know, it's a systemic thing against minorities that, you know, power, pe white people in power have kind of used, you know, to keep the man down, basically. No, they're and, the man. Keeping I mean, it, it always comes back down. to whoever has had power the longest in any government. You know, it doesn't matter what country you go to, there's always going to be a favored class in, you know, in everything. In China, there's a favored class. In Japan, there's a favored class. And Wait, so what's the favored class, class here, Joe? What's the, what's the favored class in America? Let's, let's get specific. Uh, I believe it's white people. Uh, that's not white fun, right? males. A, not, yeah. sure. White males not a class. Rich white. Rich males. white males. Yeah. Rich yeah. white people. And I, um, I mean, of course it is. Yeah, of course that's no fair. It's been three hundred years of laws and power accumulated, and you know, I understand that. Yes, it's time to take some of the power back if you're a minority, but. You know, going back to shooting two cops who were not even white, you know, yeah. Chinese. I mean, it's about individual. Their names were actors. Ramos and Lou. I mean, yeah. like right. how how <laughs> not that? I mean, it's you know, killing some random white cop who you don't know a thing about is pretty much just as shitty. It's just uh... <sighs> I mean, I've I've no problem with the the protests and stuff like that, but if you're gonna start executing people, it's never going to it's just never going to work out in your favor. It's just not the way to do it. Did we learn nothing from the Hunger Games? Like, I'm not, I'm not even kidding right now. But, like, the nice thing about that whole storyline is that the end result is, wow, we just had a totally legitimate revolution and then all of our leaders are shitty again. Like, it's almost yeah. as if the power's the problem. Hmm. Right. That's how, that's how Animal Farm ends. It's, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Oh, and it is. The power is the problem, but obviously, you know, race is one of the most prevalent things on people's mind when these, you know, it, it's at the forefront of this kind of police conversation. Um, but since people can't have, you know, a, a good dialogue about race, it can never lead to a dialogue about power. And uh, it's for, for thing, different reasons. For different reasons. Um, the thing the, the race conversation often doesn't lead to a dialogue about power, though. Like, that's sort of the mainstream liberals' problem, isn't mm -hmm. it? Like, they stick to sort of a vague, like, well, you know, I mean, Hillary 2016 will, will fix sexism, right? Just like Obama <laughs> fixed racism. There's that idea that if everybody gets to be oppressive, then that's the way it's going to work out. That's it's how we're going to fix Impre the uh, Oppressive in turn. Yeah, exactly. That's how we're going to fix it all up. That's, I mean, there's, there's so clearly, I mean, like, the, the people who deny that there is a racial element, even Rand Paul doesn't deny it, for Christ's sake, mm -hmm. like, like in, in, in criminal justice stuff. Um, they're really frustrating because, like, the origins of the war on drugs, which was the engine of the police state more than anything else, were very cynical and very, very racist. Um, yeah. And you can look that look it up. It's true. It's not you know a liberal fever dream. They were really trying to keep 
you know, ban the substances that made the black people and the Mexicans be really scary, the scary jazz music, and then the threat to the white women. Or, I mean, and also, in the 70s, when it became, you know, the official war on drugs, it was, all right, who's using drugs? It's the radicals, it's the minorities, and it's, I mean, it's everybody except middle America, and I, Richard Nixon, need a really nice domestic policy thing that's going to look good. There'll be pictures of people posing with drugs. It's going to make me look great. It well, was there, you go. there you go. Even just even that saying that was what Michelle was saying. How do you have that conversation without about race without talking about power too? Yeah. And you yeah. said you know it never it doesn't usually lead to that, but like you, you almost can't talk about how do you talk about race relations without talking about power? That's the problem with race mm -hmm. relations. The problem is right. The problem. The reason that race relations is such a problem is because of the imbalance of power that comes with it. Otherwise, it wouldn't. It's not about you know aesthetics or anything like that. It's just about power. Right. Yeah. It's nothing ingrained between right. the races that would make anything different. It's just about who has controlled you know the seats of power in America for and why they, and why they want to keep it. Why they want to keep it that way. Right. right exactly. But, it, but it's still so very us versus them, I, I'm obviously white v. black. Um, so to just jump into conversations of power is difficult. And it, and it also doesn't help that you have like the Jesse Jacksons and Al Sharptons of the world co-opting uh, every single you know one of these protest movements and standing next to the wife and or you know family of, of the victims um, pretending to give a shit. Um, and then, you know, I don't know. How do we fix race, guys? How do we fix this? <laughs> well... We have 30 minutes. All right. <laughs> start thinking. Done. Well, maybe having some more than one Hispanic, Michelle, or token, slightly less white person. Maybe that would be Hispanic. Woo. Yeah. Um, I mean, I do think that, like, there's... There, after Eric Garner, there was sort of a commendable, like... Brown, I mean, there's the case, we'll never know, because we, you know, not enough, we didn't, we don't have it on video, and there's, you yeah. know, you can, you can officially debate it until the end of time now. Um, Garner, it was right there, and um, everybody, you know, George Bush thought it was vaguely concerning that, that like, the guy wasn't indicted, like, that's, yeah, that's, that's how, problem. yeah, that's how bad we're getting. Um... But you had like you had a hint of, of disagreement where it was like, oh, liberals are pulling the race card, conservatives want to talk about cigarette taxes, and like it, to me, it was so such an imaginary debate because they were both relevant. Like a black market, the idea that criminals, you know, are expendable ties pretty nicely with well, also browner, blacker people are expendable. Like it was, there was no debate there. Everyone was agreeing, but there was still a hint of like. Damn, liberals talking about it this way, conservatives talking about it this way. I don't know. But at least they agreed, though. They agreed something was messed up there, and now, you know, now there's the backlash. Now there's the the unions um, going insane. Turning and their that, back. Yeah. Their and I can, or is that what it, I can breathe? Oh, my God, that was so I can hideous. breathe or whatever the T-shirt. That, that was the worst. I mean, that was worse than any of the, like, the brown. That was after. Was I mean, that's coming up even after those those two cops got shot in New York. You know? The people yeah. are so like, that's fucked up. Like, what the hell is the matter with you guys? So maybe it's not been completely steered away yeah. from the criticism of, of cops, at least as long as they keep doing that kind of shit. It took a major hit, but you're right, yeah. Because that was so, I mean, that that was so deeply classless and so specific. I mean, right. like, like what, you know, what do we want, dead cops? Okay, that's, you know, not good. But, like, who are you targeting there? Who are you angry at? You're angry at 800,000 people? Okay, well, you're not a threat to 800,000 people. If you're saying, I can breathe, what possible message is there besides, oh, fuck you, I'm alive, yeah. and that guy's not? I mean, what else? Yeah. There's nothing else there. It was horrible. Even from a PR perspective, like what a what a grotesque way of trying to get people over to your cause. I mean, yeah. and it's all about putting down the other person, like the other group. Like it's never about equalizing rights. It's about dragging one side down or the other side down. And now we're just going to have, you know, and you can already see it coming on Twitter and happening on Twitter. You know, a comparison of oh, who 
who gets killed more, you know? It's always, oh, but white people are killed more by cops, and then it's, oh, but black people are killed at a higher rate, oh, but cops, you know, aren't, it's not dangerous enough, oh, but then this happened. And it's just, all it is is back and forth, people just, like, throwing out different stats and factors that, you know, try and prove their arguments so they can just put down, like, the entire other class. Instead now, of trying to like build a equal, you know, bring people up. Everyone's trying to always push people down to true. their level or what you know they think should be their level. So the but, crazy is the, like the crazy, the craziest extension of that us versus them putting down the other side is shooting two cops in a car. I mean that's. That's what you were talking about before, right, Joe? About this is a systemic thing, and that that can't be. T you, how do you not talk about that? But how do you talk about it without sounding like, well, sometimes you know, right. <laughs> what else are you gonna do? <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean it's, it's taking the Twitter rhetoric and turning it into you know. Exactly, dude. Murdering. That's it. Exactly. exactly. Like, oh, you you have this stat. Well, now I'm gonna kill two people. <laughs> and, uh, exactly. So you know. It's the nuclear option, basically. <laughs> Plus, there's a huge difference between, you know, like, there's a whole bunch of cases um, of, of people who are the recipients of a no-knock or more, you know, close enough that it hardly matters whether it was officially no-knock or not, raid, people who shot cops, um, and had every reason in the world, you know, to, have the, to offer the best possible defense of saying, I did not know that that was a police officer at my door type situations. I mean, there are times when you can even make, you can make some, you know, bold and FBI attention grabbing arguments about, um, you know, when it's okay to use lethal self-defense even against the state. But, you know, this, like, there's no way to slice this one to make it okay. <laughs> like, there just isn't, you know? It was, but, but, but by the same token though, and this is something I was trying to get off of what Joe was saying is that we must not pretend that as a category, you know, black people are somehow like the same as the category of police officers. Because you will get people who truly try to make the argument that, well, you're making generalization about cops, but that's just like racism. And it's not, turns out, at all. Because cop is a job. <laughs> it's a job <laughs> where you occasionally get to kill people. Um, it's a job you didn't get drafted into. You picked it. You know? Yeah, what you want to do. You know? Like, look around and say, that's me. I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to be a hero. Or whatever, you know, from <laughs> the... You know, that you were talking about before, the kids are... The, the, the kids like cops, you know? They're not, not as much as soldiers. <laughs> but, you know, they're, they're still, like... They're up there with the hero stuff, you know? So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, that's politics in general, though, to look around and say, like, I think I can run this place better, you know? Like yeah, that's the dangerous gotta, thing, isn't it? You gotta be a certain kind of dude that you don't want to hang out with anyway. <laughs> don't want to be the man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't know with cops. I always think of this woman who was um a cop at my college, and she says that she got um she got raped. And I wrote about this for the college paper, so I'm not exactly banding about, but um when she was like 18, and she says the police treated her like garbage and basically said she deserved it. She was married to a cop who treated her like shit, and she's a cop, and she's really nice. You know, she's you know she's she's protecting a nice little college. She's she doesn't get much opportunity to do bad things. But my God, woman, like the fact that she she joined you know technically the same type of institution where these people just kept treating her like shit just continues to amaze me when I remember this. Like I don't know. There's yeah. there's got there's a way like you don't. Get off the hook just because you didn't, you know, um, outlaw drugs and you didn't, break, you know, you didn't make stop and frisk happen or other horrible policies. You don't, you, you didn't do it all yourself, but you don't get off the hook because you put on the uniform and you said I'll do this and nobody drafted you. You know, it's everybody's to blame and this, they're, just, they're all to blame. I agree. That's a funny thing that you said there that about people saying it's. Racist to not like cops. <laughs> People make it act like it's equivalent. They do. It's ridiculous. It is. Oh my god, that makes me mad. Um, but that's the whole divide and conquer. You know, us versus them. Um, whatever. That's going to lead to extreme 
taken to the extreme is that kind of what we're talking about, you know? Yeah. Again, not to condone, <laughs> not even to excuse, <laughs> but perhaps to explain, at least in the to the craziest of crazy. Yeah. Well, that why shouldn't that be part of the conversation? Explaining violence is so important and it's so dismissed, you know. Well, not you know, nine eleven hijackers hated us for freedom. Timothy McVeigh was, you know, whatever. Like, talk about why they were mad. Maybe it was a mixed thing, um, you know. But, like, it's okay to say somebody who did something absolutely unforgivable was right about something. And, you know, if you try to explain it, you might actually be able to prevent it next time. Like, Waco and Ruby Ridge were shitty. Um, and Timothy McVeigh was right about that. He was right that they were very, very bad. And the wrong part was the blowing up of the building. And, I mean, he literally took the... Now, this is getting so FBI-ready, but, like, <laughs> McVeigh... Like, I wrote my thesis partially on this stuff, so, like, you know, McVeigh took, like, power... People in power talk. And he used their terms to explain the horrible thing he did. He became the government, basically, by saying, collateral damage. I did it, you know, because my cause was important enough to kill these people. Mm. And that's, you know, like... Talking about why someone does something, why they commit an act of violence, is not saying anything about its rightness. But people are terrified to talk about it, you know. Ever since 9-11, I'm sure long before that, but it, my association is 9-11 and hating us for our freedom, and that's the end of the conversation type of thing. Yeah. Joe, mm -hmm. Michelle, we just met tonight, and I'm already like, well, I hope <laughs> we don't. Like, I'm like nervous talking about this just with the two of you. Uh, yeah. Of, let alone the internet. <laughs> we should at least be wearing sunglasses and not have. Yeah, this is bad. Um, the Unabomber, right? <laughs> some, of the, some of that stuff's pretty good in that manifesto. You know, let's be honest. I haven't read it, but I've heard. I mean, that, he's very smart, I mean, as far as I've heard. Though, you know, and I know my my cousin is. He has an that, origin. But... He has an origin story. Like, a story. <laughs> do you know this? He does indeed. Um. I used to know more in blanking. What's what's the? He, he had you know some kind of communicable disease when he was just a baby, so they had to keep him in isolation. So for like two months, the only human contact he had was the nurse coming in to like feed him with like an eyedropper. Oh, so weird. And then, so he like never connected to people. And then when he went to college, he was like the unwitting. Uh, a subject in like a psychology experiment. Yes, I did read that recently. <laughs> where they would say sat across from a table, these guys that were like in on it, and they didn't tell them that this is what they were going to do. And they were just like, well, just tell us, you know, what is it that you believe, you know? And if he was just like, well, I, you know, I think that uh, taxes are too high. They were like, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, like, just like tore him apart no matter what he said. <laughs> <laughs> like even if they agreed with it, this was the the experiment was to see like, whatever. That so was like distressing. Coupled, coupled with the origin of a baby, the baby part of it, to and like just getting his whole worldview torn down for like hours by like Harvard Law students or whatever. Like he turned into the Unabomber. He has a <laughs> super villain origin story. That's rough. <laughs> and a costume, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He's yeah. World's first. <laughs> that formula seems way too easy to hit. Like I'm scared I'm gonna run into a Unabomber. Like well, around so. every corner. No, if that every was the corner. origin story for like the Joker. I'd be like, ah, oh, no, that doesn't. <laughs> Hollywood sucks. <laughs> well, and that was back when like there appears to have been no ethics in that sort of experiment. You know, like Milligram and uh, all the other things. They're like, fuck it, let's put some children in a box and see if they <laughs> eat each other. Whatever. Ethics. Uh, what, you know, what was that prison? What was that prison? Uh, where Stanford they... prison experiment. Yeah. 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 Sure. Um, the Milgram one, uh, I, I think, is is always heartening because because like there are like two dudes. There's like clips from it on YouTube. I've watched. There are two dudes who are like, no, I don't want to do this anymore. And they're like, oh, but you have to. It's like, no, I don't have to. And I was like, there's always like two people who are awesome. Who are like, no, I'm not going to keep shocking that guy. I don't really care what you say, Mr. Lab yeah. Man. It's very yeah, but, heartening. But, but, but I have a lab coat. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, there's always, like, that's, like, my almost in my entire life philosophy is that there's always going to be, like, one dude who sits back, lights a cigarette, and says, no, I don't have to do what you say. Sorry. Yeah? That's that's my life's philosophy, that there's always going to be some guy who does it right, not that's guy. Good. That's a know. good philosophy to have. I'm going to start looking for that guy. Do it! 
it's it, 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 it's it's a fodder for mostly optimism. Yeah. Like you're still gonna hate the majority, but you know, go look, <laughs> go look at the Holocaust. You realize how many people like Raoul Wallenberg s people who were like, you know, I'm gonna save as many people as possible instead of doing my job. You know, as like a diplomat from a neutral country. I'm gonna be awesome instead. It happens, Mike. It happens. It's good. Good. Um, that was a good tangent. I was gonna tell you guys some official statistics that. I read on Alternet via uh, the New York Post, which makes it... They're from two different sources I don't trust. <laughs> Nevertheless... They're on opposite sides, so they cancel each other out. So <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so I trust it. <laughs> <laughs> Possibly. Um, but, okay, so the MIPD, in response to um, people being you know, mean to them and also the unfortunate uh, killing situation, they are do they, they're doing a work slowdown thing, which has resulted yeah. in... Is it, what what I read was 60% fewer arrests from last year, 84% fewer drug arrests, and 94% fewer like summons and like sort of low level. So basically, they're yeah yeah. So they're stopping you know um, broken window policing, and they're basically doing what all of us probably wish they would do all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank and you. I, <laughs> I guess they're praying for a crime wave that will see see how much you need us. You know, like, there's an eight-year-old covered in heroin over there. Like, that's what they're waiting for, I guess. But they're doing what they should be doing. It's it's so awkward. Like, they're, they're doing what we want them to do, but they're doing it as a petty revenge type thing. Um, and so what's in the, in the story saying, like, look, the cops aren't doing their job, but there's less arrests? But, I mean, well, of, course, of course there's less arrests. They're not arresting. But there are, I mean, there are fewer arrests in, like, all of these victim lists or, like, low-level things. Yeah, because they're their, not doing it. No, I know, but that's their response to people criticizing them is, like, improving themselves out of spite. It's just bizarre, that's all. It's very oh, bizarre. Yeah. yeah. Um, so maybe, that, maybe they'll be mad at us for a long time and keep doing that, I hope. Well, maybe, that, yeah. Is that just in New York? Yeah, I mean, that... The uh, Patrolmen's Benevolent Association apparently directed this, um, and they're the people who supposedly were the origin of the terrifying email that said, oh, we're at war now, um, with, uh, after the shooting. Mm -hmm. And that was never, like, officially made official, but, I mean, police unions, they're the, they're, they're the worst unions in the world, like, as far as I know. They're just... they all Their entire purpose is to... Bitch, when like a Philadelphia Inquirer cartoonist like makes a cartoon about kids who want to be protected from the cops, you know, and asking Santa, or they complain about sports people are protesting, and right, the, wearing the I can't breathe shirts. Yeah, they're just they're, they're trying to make police officers an elevated class. They're trying to turn them into they already are military. Well, they I mean, are. they're trying to raise it even further, I suppose, by using you know even more military. Jingo or lingo, jingoism, <laughs> and you know that's. I saw Clark Hat talking about that on Twitter. I don't know. Mm -hmm. He's a vehement and cap. I believe Clark, Clark Hat saying, you know, all the cops who turn their backs should be fired because you know. I forget why he's saying. That would be you know, awesome. Because they're you know civilian, like they're not protected by you know different set of laws. You know they're just employees, like, if your boss saw you doing that, you would be fired in any other job immediately. I mean, there's there's just no way around that, but because they have, you know, special rights, basically, you know, they can do these things that no actual employer would, you know, stand, which kind of, you know, but emphasizes the point that they're a different class. It's this weird paradox where we're told that they're unbelievably important and special and brave, which is why they're allowed to shoot someone, you know, the moment they feel threatened by the glint of, you know, a, a pen or someone reaching for a waistband, uh, like, that's, it's it's a paradox. It does not work because they either get to be as brave as they say they are, as their supporters say they are, or, you know, like and, and risk their lives and maybe, you know, there would be more deaths, I don't know. Um, that would be unfortunate, but that's how brave they are, right? That's what they're risking. They're trying to de-escalate whenever possible. They're using lethal force the last possible minute. They're not even tasering that often, you know, unless it's really, 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 like, 
Like that's if they're brave, that's what they should be doing. They cannot be brave and well officer safety being the first priority. And yet that's what they say. It's like they, they have all the cards. They have all the cards, all the pieces. It it's it's such a sham. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> no, that's well put. I love it. Can't be brave. <laughs> like, yeah, you're right, you know. These guys risk their lives every day. Of course they're gonna <laughs> Shoot you for taking <laughs> a, a cigar or whatever. Right, yeah. Yeah. They're heroes, and that's why you're dead. Right, right. <laughs> so ranty. Yeah, Lucy and the police, that's a. The weird thing is that I, I try to in. keep a respectable face with my vice stuff. So, like, one week they're like, why are you defending the police? Why don't you, you know, <laughs> why are you writing that we should burn them all? Well, that's because that's not very helpful. No one will know what's in my true heart, though. I try to keep my, let's not talk about that. <laughs> let's not talk about what governed buildings I would burn down first. It's like when you talk about, Sorry. it's like when you got into that whole thing about not using military to defend the country on Twitter, and everyone called you insane. Yeah, that was very rewarding. Being against nuking cities full of innocent civilians makes me crazy. That's yeah. what a time to be alive. <laughs> That's a great segue to our next topic, which is that the war <laughs> in Afghanistan is over, and by over we mean right. 13,000 tro American troops are still there, and the Taliban thinks they won. Oh, I was just going to ask, did we win? No. <laughs> well. According to the Taliban, they won. Um, I DVR'd it, but I don't feel like watching it over again. <laughs> The entire war? Yeah. Spoiler that, alert. <laughs> that may have filled up your entire disc to record that war. Um, I just thought this was a weird one because this is the war that a lot of people thought, like even more so than Iraq, which everyone's embarrassing and I'm going to be morally superior about all of this, um, but like everyone thought war, the war in Afghanistan was cool at the time. Like Ron Paul, our beloved crazy pants grandpa Pe Peacenik, actually voted for it. The only person who voted against it, I believe, was Barbara Lee, bless her heart, who has never gotten a moment, you know, any respect in her entire political career because she does things like vote against wars that literally everyone else is for. It was, it was, everybody was swept up in just the old playground rules of, you know, you hit me, I hit you back. Yeah. That's, that's you know. Yeah. There was even like a David Cross, you know, the comedian David Cross. Mm -hmm. He did a bit about that where it was like, Everybody's giving George Bush, you know, like a medal and saying like that's great for for doing this. He's like fucking Nader would have done that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you get hit, you hit back, you know. But, I think but that's hitting, why it was. I mean, yeah, but I mean, it wasn't though. I mean, it was not hitting back in that it wasn't, you know, grabbing Osama bin Laden personally and wringing his neck and you know his his twelve best helpers. Like it was going to war. And as a response, that's fundamentally different. Even when you know you've been attacked in this way, it's just. I mean, I I don't you know I've argued again and again that the principle of self-defense because there there are more there are more ironic conservatives who are like oh well you're against war so what if someone came into your house and attacked <laughs> your wife? Well, you know that's different. Like how many civilians are standing directly between you know uh, the, the the intruder and my wife and me? Like, and how many am I allowed to kill? Like it doesn't translate to a national scale, and I honestly don't know how it can in a world right. where you'd have to, exist. You'd have to be like in somebody else's house protecting their wife's jewelry <laughs> <laughs> from an intruder. Something more, like, yeah, yeah. To be, that would be a better, you know. <laughs> that's a more, that's closer to what war is about. Something where you're completely removed from it. Yeah. You know, but you're still expected to kill the dude that came into the house. Yeah. Anyway, well, I'm glad to hear that the war's over. Yeah, yeah. We're over. We we did a we did a great job. I love I how like that, say. <laughs> it, that one like even though Obama actually kicked that one up. A notch. I'm sorry for right. using it that way. Like it still has been <laughs> so like back. Like oh yeah, that war. I was, I was literally listening to Mike Miller's album today. That's called "We Are Still at War." Spoiler alert: It's from 2008. So that album <laughs> title sure is evergreen. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
Yeah. Yeah. When's the sequel come out? We are no longer at war. Ne- never. <laughs> Tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah. So, what's your what's your point with all this, Lucy? What's Are my we... point? <laughs> we'll come over there and show you what my point is. Um, I don't know. Like, it's just. I mean, it's just another great. Do, do we want to get into the cause and effect and the justification for the war? Or are we just talking about the fact that it was the longest war in U.S. history? Well, just like, right, let's just think and about this. nothing was accomplished. Right. I mean, the decline in support, like, it's, like, the least popular war. Like, it just went down and down and down, and it just kept, the war kept going on, and the decline kept happening, even though this was the just one. Like, this was the one where there was, a, you know, a really concrete reason. It wasn't Dick Cheney's fever dream, like, something did happen. But, like, it kept going on, and it kept being ignored, but still, you know, leaving casualties, and, like... I don't know, anytime, anytime anybody argues for a justified and limited war, just like go up like Afghanistan, like is that even happening now? Who cares, right? It's just on autopilot now. It's just another example. That's all, Joe. Sorry that you're such a warmongering monster, Joe. There is no limited wars when you occupy a country, but it is... I don't know. I mean the US could have gone in, just killed everybody, killed the Taliban, overthrown the government and left. And probably that would have been a better idea in the long run. How about you find Bin Laden before you have two wars where you're trying to find him? Oh, is he in Fallujah? Where is he? God damn it. Well, I mean, the Afghanistan government was hiding, basically, the people responsible and refusing. You know, people may have let us use their bases. I mean, stuff like that. But it's still going to be American military on Muslim ground in, you know, the Holy Land, blah, blah, blah. You know, there, there really probably wasn't a good way to go about that. No, sometimes there isn't, but I mean... It, it, it is crazy to be like that it's, you know, the war in Afghanistan's over and just kind of slide that in with all, like, people's best and worst picks for 2014, and it's just like, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, the war's, yeah. oh, the war's over, and then everybody's kind of just like, oh, I, is that still happening? Sturgill yeah. Simpson's album was pretty good, and the war's over. Right, also, cool. the war is over, and, and the, the, it's sort of like, yeah, that you just get so desensitized to the fact that there's been the longest war ever, with no point, no whatever, nothing yeah. came right. out. There's but to no be, there's no... Right, right, like, ah, we're done, we're done. And most people's answer to that is, it's not going to be like, you know, there's no, there's not gonna be a big parade about the the, the war to end all wars. Is, is that you know? It's like people. I think that it sort of seems like oh, is I I, th- I thought it already was over. You know. Oh. Right. Yeah. That's okay. generally the response. Um. Uh. Gosh. They're still over there, right? I mean, all the thirteen thousand. Um. Right. I don't know if it's just American or like a. It might be just Americans combined with other. Coalition of the Willing. That was those guys. <laughs> Wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think so. Was going to go into Afghanistan, or maybe it was Iraq. Is, 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 is that desensitivity, like, uh, of the American public now, the norm, at least, the norm of what the government wants, um, as far as you know, engagement, uh, maybe, you know, a full-scale attack like uh, Joe was describing would have probably better have been a better alternative. Just couldn't have happened, um, or it would have completely changed the, I don't know, makeup of, I don't know, the way we look at threats today. I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the government needs to, it needs to appear Stop. like it's doing something and that it's protecting not only Americans, but, you know, protecting the world. And that's how they have cartels. Doing a bang up job. To do these things, you know, if you know, if they didn't do this kind of stuff, maybe if there was a foreign conflict that you want, the United States wanted to get involved in, there would be more resistance. But because it's kind of like, you know, it's our job, it's our military's job to please the world, to you know, root out evil wherever it goes. You know, Americans. I don't know if they're, dis- they're I mean, I guess they are desensitized at this point, but in the beginning, it was more like, you know, our duty, this is what we do, and now it's getting to the well, point you mean, where... You mean the beginning of the war on terror, or the beginning of, like, 
the beginning of Afghanistan, war on terror, you know, beginning of Vietnam, Korea, it's always kind of like, okay, this is our duty, and then by the end, it's just kind of like fades out and nobody really remembers, and then... It would be a different, you know, a totally different culture, a totally different conversation, everything, if, if, it, if it had been what you talked about in the first place, or like that they found, they knew where he was before they went in, you know what I mean? Like, and if the way 9-11 was countered was by like, in and out, going in, taking them out, and then we're done. This is what happens when this is what you guys do. You know, when this is what you do to us, this is what happens. In and out, done. No extended war on terror, no anything. So, for what you were saying, Michelle, is the point to for the government to get people to be desensitized, I think it certainly favors, it's in their favor, the people are, you know. Yeah, because yeah. less, people, less people today have the skin in, their skin in the game, like, right. um, I think, I, I didn't read it, I think there's, uh, I forget who the author is, like James Fallows or something, just published an article on, in The Atlantic, um, just about people, you know, it, it, you're not seeing your little brother go to war anymore. At least not every American family is, you know, seeing a 15, 16-year-old go to war. Um, so it allows that kind of culture, that desensitivity to thrive. But that's your choice, though, right? Is you, get, you get Vietnam or you get Afghanistan. You get yeah. 60,000 dead Americans and a significant backlash to the war. Or you get, oh, is that still happening? Yeah. Oh, well. But another part of that is my wife, Laura, is a 7th grade English teacher. Right, and it, when they, uh, you know, her at the middle school where she teaches, they talked about 9/11 this year on the anniversary, and like they talk about it like it's history now. You know what I mean? Those kids don't remember. It it's not mm -hmm. so, and it's all they've ever lived in, right? So how, why would they be anything but desensitized to it? And that's what people are going to grow up in. Oh yeah, there's all war all the time, right? Yeah, drones are going to help with that. I mean. I, you know, I've made the argument that as much as I hate Obama, like, it's hard to beat the horribleness of Bush. But Obama has brought upon the brand new, you know, ability to be barely in a country, but still, you know, raining down hellfire missiles and psychological trauma, you know, to people who, like, oh, is, you know, are the Americans and their death drones up there today? Maybe. You know, who the hell knows? Um, so, I mean, that, like, that... that Technology is going to let people be in countries all the time, and the people who are actually, you know, causing the death are sitting in Utah. Right. And that's that's even more skewed, and that's even more, you know, dangerous. Even though that apparently gives people PTSD as well, which makes me kind of want to be an asshole about that. But it also kind of shows that it's not. Maybe it's not you being in danger that gives you PTSD so much as killing other people makes human beings feel shitty, which is actually a good thing. Yeah. Um, but um, with the war stuff, like you, you get you get you know really warped sometimes progressive arguments where they're like, well, we got to bring a draft back, so we stop going to war. Yeah, like compulsory service would make us more free. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the draft thing, like I get the basis of that, but. How many That's people just to light a fire under people and start right. a yeah, 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 revolution. Yeah. <laughs> but, like, how many people... My friend Kara I... wanted to vote for uh, the, for George Bush in 2008. She's like, yeah, let's just do it. Let's just everybody vote for him. Push it over the edge, you know? Give him another term. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I see the point there, even though it's alarming. I do. Um, like, I get the, the idea for, for like, the draft will make people give a shit about wars, but... The problem is how many people are you going to kill before people are like, my, this is a bad idea. I mean, 2 million dead Vietnamese, 60,000 dead Americans. Um, that war, depending on how you categorize it, was you know, more than a decade long, um, depending on, uh, depending. Like, how, or at the end of it, people were mad, and there were still people dying, and it didn't stop the moment you know, enough students were pissed about it. Like, it takes time, and people die in the meantime. So it just seems like a particularly warped argument to be like, let's sacrifice these people so people are mad about war. Like, it's not... It, it could be marketed as a new CrossFit. I think really? that maybe then, like, people can, uh, <laughs> can get behind it. Uh, why did CrossFit come to libertarianism? <laughs> why... Bring back the draft. That's we'll get rid of it. Okay, I'm I'm for it now. <laughs> I'm for it. 
right, so you don't think well, people you don't think that argument people are being ironic when they say that bring back the draft. What? The progressive so, argument to you don't think that's irony? Because that's no, really dumb. No, that's how it works. <laughs> no, yeah, that's how it worked. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, there's then there's like the sort of like god awful moderates who are like, oh, as a nation, we're like really just doing our own thing now, and we don't have a terrifyingly unified national purpose anymore. So maybe if we make like all nineteen year olds like you know sweep or go to war somewhere. Right. <laughs> like, no, even. <laughs> Nobody even watches American Idol anymore. Like, <laughs> I know. What happened to us as a nation? <laughs> Who are we? <laughs> we used to come together. Where's our terrifying unity? <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, hopefully the aliens will come soon. Just like an Independence Day, and that will kind of bring us together as a force. You know, Will Smith and Jeff Goldblum's and you just want you just want standing side by side. That's right. Bill Pullman was it Pullman? Bill yeah. Pullman. Pa yeah. Paxton. Okay. I don't want to say the wrong one. <laughs> and that's that's kind of what we need. We need an alien invasion or zombie apocalypse, something really big to bring us together. And so we have stirring politicians like Bill Pullman and his beautiful. Speech. As a people, really. I mean, that's that's beyond nation building. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. That's it's, humanity. That's what we need. Something human. Yeah. I always hate the end of Independence Day. Like, there you cut to like the British people in Iraq and shit. And, like, I kind of want to know what they were doing this whole time. Like, why did I have to stay in America with like all the quippy people? I don't know. I wonder what the British were up to. Obviously, not much. They were like, America, come on, put your money where your mouth is, you got this. Yeah, I guess Britain in uh, 1890s would have handled it better as they did in War of the Worlds. Oh, wait, that was germs, sorry, that did that. Oith germs. Oith germs. Is that enough? Never mind. No. That's good. You're the, you're you're the senior off. member of this podcast. So you're better yeah. off not remembering that. It's not very funny. Okay. My brother, if my brother watches this, he'll think that's at least, he'll... Be embarrassed for me for referencing that. <laughs> Good. Good to know. Um, all right. Well, I guess we can't talk forever, but I was going to touch on an econ to topic, which is an extension of like a semi debate Mike and I had in a bar last yeah. week. But that might, we've got, we might be here all night if we touch on that. I don't know. Another time. You should bring it up on a different one of your podcasts. I'd rather just watch people that know what they're talking about. Talk about it. <laughs> um, well, that, uh, I'll, I'll say that was like the, the notion of, of, the, of the basic income, which weirdly enough has been made, an argument made by libertarians. Um, have Joe or Michelle, have you seen that? Where yeah. like it, it would cut down enough bureaucracy that it would almost be mm -hmm. worth it to just be like I believe here. Milton Friedman was a fan. Really? Yeah. He also gave us withholding, though, so fuck that guy. <laughs> you know who else was a fan? Richard Nixon. Oh. Uh, something close to it. So yeah, it's a lot of disparate fans of that. Yeah, which is interesting. There's an anarchist criticism of it that it would be like maybe a stopgap between the move towards like an actual moneyless system and a, whatever. And that's what we were talking about a little bit. Why yeah. it's such a just what was your you know the libertarian take on it? You as a libertarian. Me, it makes me so much. Yeah. Well, well, well you know, I'm a right wing scumbag anarchist, and you're a left wing. Hippie Scumbag. faced and yeah, yeah hippie faced. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Which th there's a lot of there's a Venn diagram of hanging out. There's a lot. It's it's right. Fun. <laughs> right. But um, I like the idea. I like the idea of thinking about like you know we could just have so much more fun. If there was, <laughs> and I'm that serious. makes you a would goddamn be, hippie though. We'd be oh, a better a better you know. Get rid of some of that pesky alienation and <laughs> have a little bit of fun. It would it's be probably good in theory. It would be an improvement in theory, but then, of course, unintended consequences come in, and I don't think anyone, anyone who pretends they know exactly what would happen as far as the big picture, yeah. macro picture, I don't think anyone really knows how it would affect everything. And it might just be too sweeping to really just kind of just throw at the wall and see what happens. I mean, there might be some pretty dire consequences. Or yeah. it might work fine. I don't know. Who cares? Know those yeah. dire, <laughs> dire consequences, <laughs> like like Big Macs are five bucks instead of a dollar or whatever. We're like, that's okay. And then the other part of it, 
it's not. But you know, I don't know. I, that's okay to say that that might be part of the part of the okay. unintended consequences. But here might be a better unintended consequence. If everybody is a little freed up, they have you know a thousand bucks a month or whatever it is, you know, and get to be freed up a little bit to not be you know worried about the how they're going to make their ends meet all the time, or they could just say, all right, I'm just going to skate by on this thousand bucks a month for a while and just live and be a human being instead of like a, a drone. Well, then maybe they we could think up, we could be as a better a better peoples that could think up, <laughs> could think yeah, up some to, to, to your economy. Economy. economy, and then they're getting more <laughs> food, and, they're <laughs> and congratulations, you just ruined America. So oh, we're in the middle of what uh, the, the two men folk just now. I'm, I think I'm in the middle of the sentiments expressed. Well, um, like, well, Joe, I think what if it's that bad of an idea? What, I mean, what if like if that's all the government did? Um, you know, like literally, like if that's all they did, like or or the only problem is that's never right. all they do, is it? They're gonna it's they're always... gonna pile it on top of all the other shit we have. And the mainstream right, and then they just will, like, stop. It's just the mainstream crap. liberals will pile it on top of the shit that's already there, and the DEA and the DHS and the CIA right. and the military, and everything will still be there, and the bureaucracy, you know, type of, of, of welfare and aid and all the bad shit along with it, all of the, you know, less helpful stuff is all going to be there, and then they'll just be added, added like, here's some more money. Like it's, yeah. Bureaucracies but, never reduce themselves. They always yeah. grow. They add... They never subtract. Well, you know, no... the, the, the Robert Hicks thing the is that it's a ratchet. It's a ratchet with, in terms of power where, like, you know, they have a crisis, World War II, Great Depression, whatever, a ton of power to government. After the crisis, ebbs a bit. Like, the, it goes down a little, but it never goes back to what it was before the crisis. Right. So, like, there's a little... It may, you know, go back a little, but it never goes away, basically, which seems about right. Yeah, it's but we let that happen. You know, lot. people... People let that happen. People don't care. They let that happen because you know they got better things to worry about. Uh, so maybe if you you know didn't have to worry about poverty and starving and could be a little less alienated, maybe you'd find a way to say, I don't think I want this to happen anymore. Would be a better peoples. <laughs> but no, you're, be, you're still be getting crapsing around America with their free money, not caring about the system. No, yeah, but you're gonna get yours too, so it's all good. I want. What do you care what you do with it? I'm poor. I'm <laughs> Pretty much we, anything that gets me money, I'm okay with. God, I needed like a right? super right wing conservative on this podcast. It's gonna be. <laughs> it's going. To, <laughs> this is not. My reputation will be shattered. It's it's, go, it's going to referendum in in Switzerland, right, in 2015. And of mm. course they're of course they're gonna to be yeah nationwide there. They're gonna try to it. be two thousand six hundred dollars a month to every citizen. Okay, and they're of course it's gonna pass. Who's gonna say <laughs> I vote no on twenty six hundred bucks a month? I that's thing that am horrible. Be, I would if vote. If Rhode no. Island did that, I would vote that's no. fine. Well, you. If it's a federal law, I don't think so. Switzerland's small. They're rich. They can handle. But what's cool life. is it's gonna people are gonna talk about it, and then there's gonna be that conversation. People are gonna say maybe we could do that in uh, you know in, in the United States. Hell, maybe let's just do it in Johnstown. You know, I'll start out here in Johnstown. <laughs> I still don't, like, you know, I think this conversation is about 40 years premature in terms of, like, chopping the state. Well, when they pieces. dig this episode out of the time capsule, they'll see just how ahead of the, the curve we all are. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, all right, so Mike's a giant hippie, and Joe's a horrible right-wing monster who wants free money, and Michelle is, like, conic and sensible. That's my summation of the situation here. Um, all right. I guess let's 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 not talk on that, even though it's fun. Um, well, to be god awful, we could we usually what we do is the whole what have you been enjoying in the last week that's not related to politics in any way. Um, I suppose you could you know do the entire year considering that it's this should have been a New Year's theme show, oh, yeah. and and to be terrible as Mike mentioned with the. Afghanistan and oh, who's your top five list <laughs> terribleness? Um, all right. What this, uh, I don't. I'm. I'm too. I don't want to stick to themes. I hate it. All right. So, Joe, what have you been enjoying in either the last week or the last year? If you can quickly sum it up, it's not related to politics. Tell me I've your been enjoying, I've been enjoying music for the first time, and I don't even know. The last time I made a top ten list was probably 2004. <laughs> And this year, I finally decided just to 
bite the bullet and download every good or noteworthy album of the year and just listen to them. So that's what I've been doing, and I've actually found that I rather enjoy music, even no, new that's, music. That's good. I don't tend yeah, to listen to things the year they come out. I've like, said I've hated now. music for 10 years now, but maybe <laughs> I just wasn't trying hard enough. Yeah, it's weird. Okay. Um, well, we can, Joe and I are going to do like a whole music uh, podcast in theory soon when we when we do a no uh, so wrap up. Top 25 and best 10 songs. I just had like barely like t top 10 songs and like four of them are like from compilations and I'm bullshitting because I never listen to things that you like I'm out. Probably at least one Taylor Swift, huh? Um, yeah. She's from Pennsylvania. <laughs> Pennsylvania. Blank space is pretty okay, you guys. I'm sorry. But let's not, let's not talk about that right now. Um, okay, Joe likes music now. I spent a productive year um, trying to read and watch things about the apocalypse as much as possible for no apparent reason, um, provoked by watching and reading on the beach. So I've been reveling in like really depressing, usually nuclear war type scenarios. Um, and probably the best thing that I read <laughs> or watched about that was A Canticle for Leibowitz, which everyone should read because it's really, really beautiful and depressing. And you guys should read that. I thought you um, meant, like, the Left Behind series. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I want to read that because I think it would be funny to write about it, but I also don't want to read that. I think I've Just watched watch it. The movie. It's really Just watch the movie with uh, <laughs> Mike Seaver. I watched it. It was so fucking boring. At least Fireproof, which I watched drunk once, has, like, it has more, like, entrancing awfulness. Like, the way he basically, like, abuses his wife and we're supposed to, just, like, be excited that they get back together. Oh my god, that movie is so horrifying. Um, oh, and did you the, see the leftovers? Did you watch the show, The Leftovers? You know, I tried to watch that and it didn't grab me. Um, I don't know. It's pretty cool. It's pretty is cool. it? It's a slow burn, but if you can watch them all at once, right. yeah, it's, it's cool. I'll that's what I've been That's what I enjoyed this year. I enjoyed The Leftovers. I watched, uh, you know, uh, probably watched quite a few entire series. Now that I got the Netflix. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only time I can do that is when everybody else is sleeping in my house, so I stay up all night and watch it, because the rest of my time has been what I've really been enjoying this year, and that's just, you know, my kids, Jude turned one, and, and Jack's four, and, you know, so they're fun. That's what I've been doing this year. Try to let go of the, There's no politics in that, except Yay! for the, you know, except for the, you know, the difference is, I, I told my friend this when she was like, you know, does it change you? You're supposed to, you know friend Lauren said, you know, you're supposed to change when you have kids and whatever, and I was like, I, I guess I still think, I still think the world's going to end, I just don't want it to anymore. <laughs> wow, but, that's uh, like a, that's the that's, difference. That's, you know? <laughs> I need a moment with that. Hmm. That's, <laughs> wow. Right, How about you, Michelle? What did you enjoy this year? Damn it, Mike. Uh, Mike <laughs> show. <laughs> Respect the hierarchy. I know, but you're, 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 you're making me uncomfortable, so I just move it on along. <laughs> You know. I've also been enjoying Look over the Netflix. There. <laughs> a lot of Netflixing. Um, I enjoyed living in two different cities um, this year. I lived in Atlanta for a bit, working for the Koch brothers indirectly, because um, I am a spawn of Satan. I would never do that. And I want reform in the criminal justice system, so that makes me evil. Um, been catching up on a lot of Netflix. BoJack Horseman, do you guys watch that? No. I've heard. Oh, it's That's amazing. Awesome. It's good. And I've just been trying to avoid politics as much as you, uh, as much as possible, but I get caught off guard when friends are like, hey, did you hear about this? What's your opinion? And almost autopilot, an opinion will come out. And I'm like, wait, I haven't been following that. How is it possible that I give a shit about Mitch McConnell that much? It's like summer. Oh, God, nice. I don't give a shit about Mitch McConnell. I don't. I thought I didn't, but like... I never me, had like, that delusion. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, so I'm going to try to... I don't know, 2015 resolution will be to talk less about politics, I guess. Well, that's good. I like that. Um... Yeah, I, I gotta say, like, as much as I kind of want to, like, go to conventions in 2016 in, like, a bitter Mencken-esque, like, I hate all of you people way, 
I can't even like pay enough attention to the political process to like get towards that if anyone would send me. Like that's how much Mitch McConnell does not interest me in the world. Um, but I'm failing at the, the segment here. Um, wow. I didn't drink enough coffee. Um, you know, the highlight of my year was probably filling in for Radley Balco at the Washington Post for two days, which is yeah. political, but was so epic. Um, the rest of my year was quietly typing for anti-war and vice and stuff. Um, I did, however, get back into um, a gentleman named Mike Miller's music, um, <laughs> so that's good. I really I left it neglected for too long. Um, and that is our segue into shameless self-promotion. Say, Mike, where can the good people of the Internet see your works, which I will also put you know, on the side with a link and all, but tell the people. Uh, you can get our stuff for, for free at Bandcamp. Just bandcamp.com. You know, and the Spike of the Beagle Club. I think it's and the Spike of the Beagle Club dot com. No, it's and the Spike of the Beagle Club dot Yeah, that sounds right. Never um, ask a left anarchist to promote themselves because they're terrible at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah <pretty laughs> okay, Google and the Spike of the Beagle Club, and then you'll find some quality music. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. It'll come up. It has to. <laughs> That's what Google does. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's it's good music. I was listening to uh, some of it today. Um, cool. It's weird that Mike Miller's on my podcast right now because yeah, because I like to fawn over him sometimes in bars for the past decade of my life. Or so <laughs> it's weird. Oh yeah, eight years, but still. Anyway, um, someone promote themselves. This is awkward. Not really. It's great, Joe. <laughs> um. Well. Eventually, you'll see my list on the Stag Log, and I've been, I don't know, building people websites and helping my father learn Twitter again. And <laughs> so follow my father and my Uncle John <laughs> and Ethan Casey and, I don't know. That's about other it. I'm, people. Anything for, I'm only helping other people. He's like a saint of PR. It's beautiful. He just yeah. promotes other people, yes. <laughs> shamelessly. Michelle, uh, hey. what about you? Promote your um, something, something you like, I'll anything. Amazon and Netflix and things that make my life better. You promote those? <laughs> That's what it. I'm promoting. They don't I'll get enough promotion, I don't think. You know? <laughs> So, I help out the underdog. Give them yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. Netflix there. too. I heard they're struggling. Uber. <laughs> all these things I like. Oh, Uber is struggling actually, yeah. um, but not Thanks. in that. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, we allow that kind of shameless capitalism here on um, on politics for people who hate politics. Um, Get a got a little rusty here. Conciseness tends to leave when I stop doing this podcast. Um, uh, you can read my works at Vice and Anti-War and Rare and the Stag Blog. And you can see this podcast at YouTube and at Liberty.me, which I think costs like $5 a month now, so you could totally join that if you wanted to, audience. Um, all right, I'm gonna wrap this shit up. This was great. Joe, thank you. Michelle, thank you, th thank you for being the least iconic you've ever been. And Mike, thank you for being on a podcast and for the albums that I was listening to today. They were Thanks cool. for having me. It was super fun. Yay. Okay, bye, audience. Bye, everyone.